Good morning, each one of you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, so let's start with our session. Head of the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, esteemed faculty members, expert speakers of the day, and all participants. A very good morning to all of you. Today we have gathered to attend the lecture on machine learning in remote sensing applications under the Research, Innovation, and Technology Lecture Series 2021, organized by the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, Punjabi University, Patiala. A warm welcome to all of you. Before starting today's session, I would like to introduce our expert speakers of the day. Firstly, we have Dr. Reed Kamal Tiwari. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Dr. Tiwari did his MSc in Geology from Ramsey University, followed by MTech in Remote Sensing and GIS from SRM University, Chennai. He did his PhD in Earth Sciences from IIT Roorkee, during which he joined Center of Glaciology at Wadia Institute of Himalayan Geology, Dehradun, as a scientist. Presently, Dr. Tiwari is working as an assistant professor in Department of Civil Engineering at IIT Roorkee. Dr. Tiwari has several publications, patents, and articles to his name. His work on geology of moon produced first pieces of evidence about the recent volcanism on the far side of the Earth's moon. So I'm very pleased and honored to welcome Dr. Tiwari for today's lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you for joining, sir. The second speaker of the day is Dr. Sartaj Veer Singh Tillon. Dr. Tillon did his B.Tech and M.Tech from Punjab Technical University followed by a PhD in Electronics and Communication Engineering from the same institute. Dr. Tillow has been awarded a fellowship by Science and Engineering Research Board, New Delhi. He is working as a visiting researcher with Department of Civil Engineering at IIT Roper. Dr. Tillow has authored many SEI indexed articles, Scopus indexed book chapters, and holds many inventions to his name. He is an active member of various international and national societies. Dr. Tillow is specialized in interfacing of electronics and communication devices and image processing tools. Dr. Tillow, we are very much delighted to welcome you to today's event. Now, Thank you, before we start, thank you, sir. Now, before we commence with our today's session, I would request our honorable HOD, Dr. Raman Mani, to say a few words. Respected Dr. Jeev Kamal, Dr. Sartaj B, faculty members of the department and participants, it's my pleasure to welcome you all at the expert talk on a very, very important subject, the machine learning in remote sensing. Under the research, innovation, technology lecture series started by the department. Now the purpose of this series was that the students take too much time to find the areas of their research. Sometimes I have seen that the students take uh, uh, six to eight months or even to one year and they are not able to find the proper research area, uh, uh, recent research areas uh, uh, to do their PhD work. So with this thought, the department uh, started this series that when the experts uh, they will deliver it a lecture on one particular subject. The students will be aware of the various areas of the research. So uh, I am very thankful to the uh, experts today, Dr. Reed Kamal and Dr. Sartagvil, for sparing their valuable time uh, to deliver a talk on very, very important subjects. So, sir, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, the area of machine learning, as you all know that uh, it is now applicable in the sphere of life. And uh, today's lecture is that the remote sensing, machine learning in remote sensing. 
we see the application of a, a machine learning report, report sensing is so useful that if you want to do the urban monitoring, if you want to do the surveillance, if you want to do find the patterns, so there are so many areas like in agriculture. So there are so vast application of remote sensing, machine learning and remote sensing. So I hope that at the end of this lecture, all the students, faculty members, and the researchers, they will be well versed in the various applications of machine learning in the remote sensing. And I hope that uh, with this lecture, they will be able to save a approximately six to one month of their literature review because students keep on finding literature review and they are not able to find the proper area of research. So thank you so much for uh, joining all the participants. And I hope that at the end of this lecture, you all will be well versed with the various applications of machine learning and remote sensing. So now not taking much of your time, I hand over the session again to our uh, worthy colleague and the coordinator of the, this expert talk, Dr. Nicole. Thank you so much. So uh, for the starting of the session, so we, uh, shall we start, sir? Yes, we can. Uh, I will start uh, first. Okay. You will, um, okay. Then Dr. Sutaj will join afterwards. I mean, yes. he will deliver the lecture afterwards. Okay. Fine, sir. So you may start presenting. Yes, I am just sharing. Fine. Hope the presentation is visible to everyone. Yes, it is visible, sir. I hope it is visible to all the participants as well. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think it is uh, visible, sir. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for a uh, uh, nice introduction. And uh, this is really a, a good initiative that when uh, we talk about the uh, various topics, it will be very good uh, for uh, students to get something new from that and start their research. So uh, we have decided to uh, break the presentation into two parts. I will be introducing the remote sensing, uh, basics of the remote sensing. What is the remote sensing? Uh, sometimes we are a bit confused and we don't know about the entire uh, uh, domain of the remote sensing. So I will be introducing the basics of remote sensing and, uh, and then Dr. Sartaj Veer will be explaining the machine learning algorithms and how we apply into uh, those algorithms into the remote sensing. So without taking much time, uh, let us start with the definition of remote sensing. And uh, when we talk about the remote sensing, it is the not only the technology, it is both technology and science of. Uh, yeah, it is both the technology and science of acquisition of information without coming into contact with any natural or man made structures. In the remote sensing, we analyze the variation in the way Earth's surface features reflect and emit. Uh, here I am using the, both the terms reflect and emit the electromagnetic radiations uh, to derive the information on these features. So one of the best example of remote sensing can be seen from this presentation itself. I am presenting from Roper and everyone is listening uh, from their own home, uh, comfort of their own home or the uh, department. So. No one is in contact with me, but you all are uh, getting the information about the uh, this presentation and you are also visualizing me using the video camera and your computer screen. So this is one of the example of remote sensing. So any any information if we gather without coming in contact with the object, then that technology or the science behind it is known as remote sensing. And uh, if we talk about the typical remote sensing system, this uh, diagram highlights it uh, very well. We have our sun source of the energy, which is uh, sending the energy toward the Earth's surface and it is reflected. And when the energy is absorbed here, 
so then the uh, these energies are also emitted by the earth surface like in thermal region what happens is that the earth surface when it is above the 0 degree kelvin then it reflect it emits the electromagnetic radiation through uh, through it and those radiations are captured by the sensors which are installed at the aerial platform satellite platform or any other platform and uh, even the terrestrial platform we take a uh, mobile and take a photograph then someone sees that photograph and know uh, about the uh, object of which we have taken the photograph that is also a remote sensing kind of a remote sensing that is called terrestrial remote sensing then this data are recorded either in the digital form or in the pictorial form and then we, it is analyzed either visually or digital uh, digitally nowadays we are most relying on the digital platform but uh, for the verification of the output we have to go to visual image interpretation also and then those uh, information are stored in the gis environment and then it is given to the users what is what is the source of energy for remote sensing applications if we talk about this then everybody would be aware of electromagnetic radiations the sun is one of the uh, prime source of electromagnetic natural electromagnetic radiations which are coming to us in the wavelength of 0.4 to 0.7 micrometers and the uh, you from uv radiation to near infrared radiations and these regions are uh, all are coming towards the earth surface and then it is reflected back <clears throat> in remote sensing we also use the thermal uh, ir and microwave data these two are uh, completely different uh, so we can divide the remote sensing into three aspects optical remote sensing thermal remote sensing and microwave remote sensing optical remote sensing deals in the visible region the thermal remote sensing is uh, another category and then microwave remote sensing deals in the another region now what happens when the uh, radiations interact with the earth surface these radiations are either absorbed transmitted uh, transmitted or reflected so some energy is absorbed by the surface some is uh, reflected and some is transmitted inside the object which is gathered uh, which is stored in the surface and later on it is emitted in the form of longer radiations so when we talk about the reflection the reflection can also be of different type one reflection could be specular reflection like uh, the reflection that we see from the water bodies or in the microwave region uh, when uh, there is a tall building or any corner uh, edgy kind of object is there then from those edges we see the uh, uh, high reflection and that is called specular reflection and then the most ideal refle uh, reflector for the earth's uh, feature is the diffuse reflector in diffuse reflection it uh, the incoming radiations are reflected in all the direction so why it is important because if we have a satellite and satellite is capturing the information suppose we have a satellite here and it is capturing the information down below and this is the source of the this is the source of the radiation suppose our sun so if the object is uh, having the specular reflection the satellite will capture nothing so if it has a diffuse reflection it will capture the about the object so uh, most of the earth surface features are having diffuse reflection now when we come to the source of the energy or radiation i told you that sun is one of the prime source and when the remote sensing system uses the 
sun as a source of energy that, and that is uh, when the uh, like your optical camera your mobile camera or any other camera that you hold uh, satellite has similar camera and when uh, it uses the energy which is coming from the sun then those sensors are called passive sensors because they don't have their own source of uh, illumination and when the sensor itself uh, sent the signal toward the uh, electromagnetic radiation and which is uh, uh, captured by the satellite then those sensors are called active sensors the radar is one of the prime example of active sensor so now how does the electromagnetic radiation uh, interact with the atmosphere in atmosphere when the electromagnetic radiation passes through then we see two phenomena scattering and absorption uh, so some rays are scattered so we have three types of scattering relay scattering my scattering and non-selective scattering uh, when you go in a foggy night and when you switch on the headlamp of your car you will see that you will not be able to see anything because a, a blanket of uh, rays will be created in front of you that is because of the phenomena of scattering so uh, when the uh, remote uh, uh, the sun rays are coming toward the surface of the earth then also scattering happens and that is why we can see the clouds and uh, same things are also recorded by the satellite so and another phenomena which happened is absorption everyone knows that because of the presence of ozone layer we don't get the uv radiation so uh, and uh, in atmosphere we have water vapor carbon dioxide ozone and many uh, many other gases so these gases and elements tend to absorb many of the radiations which are coming from the sun why this is important because if the radiation is getting absorbed and we build a sensor which works in those uh, wavelength then we will be able to not visualize anything in the earth surface so the radiation which passes through the atmosphere are called atmospheric windows the wavelength which can pass through the atmosphere are called atmospheric windows here uh, all the atmospheric windows are listed and the bold ones are the prime uh, atmospheric windows where the satellite sensors are built like in the visible region you can see that uh, 0 0.302.75 to 0 is the range which is most prominent in the optical region if we build a sensor which works at the uh, wavelength of point uh, 7 6 then we will be uh, getting only a dark image because those radiations are not allowed by the atmosphere to pass through and when the radiation is not coming inside the earth's surface they cannot go outside also so now we have talked about the absorption scattering uh, transmission so what are the radiations which reaches the sensors so there are two type of radiations which reach the sensor uh, one is directly which is reflected by the object and second radiations which reaches the sensor are from the nearby pixels suppose there is a um, area a land surface and some water body is also present nearby so water has a specular reflection <clears throat> so it reflects the uh, radiation in a particular direction so if that radiation is also uh, mixing with the reflection of the land surface then the land surface will appear brighter than the land surface where there is no water body so that is one addition which is uh, added to the reflected light then in the atmosphere <coughs> what happens is that because of the scattering the light rays are transmitted in every direction so some of those light rays are also sent in the path of the sensor 
so the those radiations are called path radians and all these things are combined together and we uh, capture everything through the sensor and that is why when we analyze the image we have to do first the atmospheric correction here we analyze the atmospheric uh, uh, water content and other thing different models are used and then we uh, correct the image and subtract this path radians from the images now coming to the remote sensing images what are remote sensing images so satellite receives the radiations the radiations which are reflected by the earth surface and these radiations are nothing but the brightness value different brightness of the ground object in different wavelength the uh, suppose some object may be brighter in the red region of the electromagnetic electromagnetic uh, radiation and some may be in the green uh, wavelength some objects reflect more the red uh, region and some re uh, object reflect more the green region or blue region or any other region so the, the amount of reflection is captured by the uh, sensors and they are recorded as a digital numbers now as soon as the digital numbers come uh, the application of computer science people uh, comes from here because uh, we uh, when we do image processing and we analyze the image we analyze nothing but the digital numbers they are the uh, data points that we analyze so this is how a image looks like and this is the visual form of the image that we see in our computer screen but background of that is something like this when we see this portion here a bridge is passing and nearby water bodies are there so bridge is brighter and water bodies are darker so if we see this uh, representation in the uh, form of data you will see that these values are more and these values are less 10 12 13 and these are 128 130 140 and these are the value of bridge and these are the value of uh, water bodies so uh, using different algorithms what we have to do when we have to identify the bridge then we have to identify these numbers uh, from the other numbers now what type of images that we have in remote sensing we have three kinds of images primarily first is the panchromatic image second one is the multispectral image and third one is the hyperspectral image in panchromatic image what happens that a single band of image is captured in a black and white form so the entire electromagnetic region that is from point 3 to point 9 we capture only one image in multi spectral what happens that we capture multiple images in different electromagnetic region like for a green region we capture one image for blue region we capture one image and for uh, red region we capture another image so we combine these three to get a colored uh, diagram of the earth surface and that is called multi-spectral that 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 means we have different spectral bands of the images and hyperspectral it is also a kind of a multi-spectral image but here uh, the wavelengths are further divided into hundreds of different spectral regions like in uh, multi spectral we capture one band of image from point 3 to point 4 will become one uh, band but in multi spectral point 3 1 to point 3 2 uh, will be one spectral band so here we'll have uh, image uh, a single image uh, multiple images captured uh, like in hundreds of images captured for a particular region at a given time Uh, 
now uh, coming to the uh, another form of sensor is passive microwave sensor when the sensor is uh, working in the microwave region our earth surface features sometimes emits the microwave data also so these microwave data uh, are captured by the sensors which are emitted from the earth surface is known as passive microwave sensors and these are called radiometers annotation is on so i am not able to change the slides yeah so uh, then another type of sensor is active microwave sensor and these are of two type imaging and non imaging the imaging microwave sensors are one of the best example is radar and we use radar to capture the images of our earth surface you might have heard about the sar images the recent mission which is planned by our indian space research organization is reset and that and that will be launched uh, reset has been launched and the new mission uh, is nisar which they have planned uh, isro nasa uh, sar mission and that will be launched uh, in the coming days and it will it captures the image uh, of the earth surface in the microwave region now how do we identify the ground feature we know that uh, what is the uh, behavior of each object depending upon different material type each object behave differently in different spectral region spectral region means the different wavelength of the Generally electromagnetic no. radiation so uh, those reflection if we plot against the wavelength then that is called spectral reflectance curve like this in blue region uh, a particular object is reflecting 10% or 5% in near infrared region that is the wavelength of 0.8 it is uh, reflecting almost 40%. So this is a kind of, uh, we pl plot the reflectance against the wavelength and that is called spectral reflectance curve. And when we know a uh, spectral reflectance curve of any object and we have the satellite image, then we can compare both and then we can find out which type of material is present in the satellite image. Now, uh, a spectral reflectance curve of some common object you can see here, like a vegetation, has a distinctive property. It reflects more in the near infrared region and absorbs in the red region. And uh, some uh, somewhat reflection is high in the region of green. That's why the vegetation appears green in the visible region. And when uh, but we uh, can see here that in the, uh, when we plot the uh, spectral reflectance curve of a healthy vegetation, it is more uh, reflective in the near infrared region. So if, if we take an image of a near infrared region of any area, and if the some feature is appearing very bright, it can be a vegetation. Now, the remote sensing sensors and platforms what can be a platform for these remote sensing sensors the platform can be uav aircraft or satellite anything can be platform we just have to mount a camera there and we use those platform to send the camera to a higher elevation and capture the uh, image so we have two terms remote sensing sensors and remote sensing platforms Sensors can be uh, the camera or the radar and platform can be UAV aircraft or a satellite. And now coming to a uh, important aspect that is resolution. Resolution, uh, what is a resolution? 
uh, this is one of the property of uh, the remote sensing images and the first type of resolution is spatial resolution a spatial resolution is the ability of the sensor to distinguish between two ground objects then the another resolution is temporal resolution and it is related to repeat cycle of the satellite uh, the satellite today captures the image of suppose punjab and after how many days it will come again to the, the same position and captures the image so some satellites have a temporal resolution of 10 days that means after 10 days it comes to a, uh, the same place where it was before 10 days then there is spectral resolution spectral resolution means uh, how much uh, finely the satellite uh, or the sensor is capturing the earth feature means uh, uh, the spectral uh, resolution of panchromatic image will be lower than multispectral and uh, and uh, the uh, spectral resolution of multispectral will be lower than the hyperspectral so if the sensor is able to capture the uh, distinguish between each and every wavelength of the uh, electromagnetic radiation then it will have a higher spectral uh, resolution and then another uh, important uh, resolution is there how we store the data uh, means it is related to radiometric resolution if we see two bit image that means it has only two different sets it can capture but if we see the same area in 8 bit image we can see that how different uh, uh, sets of the gray region are stored so in a 8 bit image we can capture between 0 to 255 values so we will be able to identify even the minute changes in the reflection of the ground object but uh, in the 2 bit image if we store the image in the 2 bit size then we will not be able to see the minute variation in the reflectance of the object now coming to the image processing part i told you uh, earlier that we do two type of image interpretation one is visual image interpretation and another is the digital image interpretation during the visual image interpretation we look into following aspect that is tone or the color of the object texture of the object shape size shadow where the object is that is sight or association and pattern pattern of the color what uh, pattern it is forming so the, uh, if we combine all these uh, factors then we will be able to identify which type of object is present in the image and the digital image processing which is more uh, uh, common that is uh, nowadays more common and where the machine learning approach also applies is digital image processing and here we select the data then we pre-process the data we do some enhancement and then we do classification and this is the point where we identify different objects which are present in the image and here we do the application of machine learning which Dr. Sartaj Veer will be taking just after this slide and these are the application area of the remote sensing like in land use land cover mapping water resources mapping and monitoring crop mapping and yield prediction we can use uh, machine learning is very much used in the yield prediction area uh, here we take different images which shows that how the crop is growing over the time and then we give this data as an input to uh, different machine learning algorithm and machine learning algorithm help us in predicting that what will be the future yield from those crops because uh, the remote sensing images can only capture how the crop is growing and how the crop is uh, changing its color or its size its textures all this information is water content everything can be captured by the remote sensing but 
somehow we need to use those information to know the yield of the crop. And here the algorithm, uh, machine learning algorithms come into place. And now another uh, area is snow cover mapping and monitoring, forest mapping, air quality and wind monitoring is another application of remote sensing, uh, then geological mapping and many other applications are there like uh, traffic uh, flow monitoring and uh, surface feature, urban mapping, urban heat island mapping, all these things can be done using the remote sensing images. With this slide, I will end my presentation. Hope you will be uh, uh, now well versed with the basics of the remote sensing, that what is a remote sensing, what are the different aspects of the remote sensing that we must look into, like resolution of the image, the temporal coverage of the image, and uh, what are the different applications of the uh, remote sensing. And uh, now Dr. Sartaj Bhir will take the machine learning part for your uh, presentation. I'll be stopping the sharing. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Sataj, please. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. So yes, uh, anybody can provide me a share link. Actually, there is a, uh, some, uh, if you have, don't have a permission. Thank you, Dr. Sataj, we're just sharing it with you. Yes, ma'am, this one, please. Thank you, Dr. Veet Kamal, for such thank a you. enlightening lecture. I will be available for any questions after the presentation of uh, Dr. Sartajvir. Uh, so uh, first, uh, let him finish his presentation, and then we, we can answer any questions uh, together. Okay, sir. Yes. Uh, hopefully, uh, my screen is. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Thanks a lot for confirming. Uh, yes, sir, a very good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Pajir Singh and I am presenting on machine learning and its applications in our remote sensing. And uh, Dr. Reed Kamal Tiwari have already covered a very critical part of our remote sensing. And uh, now I will continue from the machine learning. Now, uh, before come towards the machine learning, we have to just go through the what are the previous methods. Previously, uh, we are using uh, our own experiences. Okay. We are uh, using our own experiences and judgment to predict the outcomes. And then it is uh, in earlier 1900, we switched to the manual calculations to predict the outcomes. And then uh, we switched to the there is statical uh, programming languages uh, to predict the outcomes. And in late 1990s, uh, we based on the uh, the calculations are based on the visual statistical softwares, which involves the drag and drop. And and now there is an automated machine learning in which the software already knows that uh, how to process the data and what kind of uh, expectations in the output. So the first point is what is a machine learning? Uh, according to the uh, author uh, Samuel, the machine learning is a field of study that gives the computer the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And according to the Herbert Salmon, uh, who was the one of the founding father of the artificial intelligence, learning is any process by which a system improves the performance from the experiences. And uh, the, this definition has been further refined by the Tom Michael, uh, in which uh, he is saying that the, the machine learning is a study of computer algorithms that improves automatically through the experiences and by use of the previous data. So the point is that what there is need of a machine learning. Nowadays we have a lot of data and we have to scrutinize uh, some uh, that is a, only a desirable data. For example, there is a first one is a personalized news and hopefully uh, the, most of the uh, most of the participants are already aware about that there is a Google News is there. And uh, the Google News, what we, uh, what uh, the task which is performed by the Google News, it is basically providing the only the relevant contents which you have earlier searched on the Google search engine. 
so that is a uh, personalized news and the second one is a mail filter the what the mail filter that is a spam out your undesirable emails and give you the desirable emails so there is a uh, kind of a um, mail filter uh, which is based on the machine learning and provide you the relevant emails and the another part of a machine learning the which requires the machine learning that is ability to mimic humans there is and recognizing the uh, handwriting characters etc so why there is need of a machine learning now the as i already told you there is a flood of uh, available data is there especially over the internet and fortunately uh, currently we have a uh, increasing computational power is there and the growing progress in the available algorithms uh, which was uh, developed by the researchers and there is one more important aspect there is a increasing support from the industry because every uh, every industry wants to be uh, automated machine structures while uh, while producing the products so uh, there are some three basic terms which are most relevant with the each other that is the first one is the artificial intelligence the artificial intelligence is a technique which enables the machine to mimic human behavior and the machine learning is further subset of, uh, is a subset of ai which uses the statistical methods to enable the machines to improve the experiences so there is a further uh, that is opted by this deep learning there is a subset of uh, machine learning which makes the computation of multi layer neural network feasible so this is a very important term there is a multi layer uh, neural that uh, we will cover in the upcoming slides so first we have to understand the difference between classical uh, machine learning and the deep learning the classical uh, machine learning uh, in which there is a input image this one is a input image and we are considering only a certain uh, features like the roundness of face distance between the eyes nose width etc and then we apply the uh, classifiers and the classifiers can be any one of them there is a spore vector machine random forest etc or decision tree and then we will get the output but in case of a deep learning it will uh, it will cover each and every features of the input image so uh, here you can see that there are more than one hidden layers are there so there is a, whatever the if the hidden layers there is a one of one layer is there then it is referred to as a machine learning but if it is more than one hidden layer that is referred to as a deep learning so the deep neural networks so that gives you the more information as compared to the machine learning so that is a, a basic difference between the classic machine learning and the deep learning now what is the uh, so there is a important there is a learning process and the testing and as we know that the real world is analog and in order to convert this uh, analog information into a lexical form we need a sensors and the sensors can be of any type there is a cameras maybe there there is a uh, thermometer sat there and then we need to convert this electrical signals into a feasible form there is uh, already uh, told by dr rith kamal tiwari there is a, whatever we are getting there is a digital numbers and we have to uh, convert it into a some representable form that is the task of a uh, pre processing in which we are filtering the noise uh, we are normalizing the image then the further step includes the dimensionality reductions in which we are selecting we are selecting only a certain type of features and rejecting there is a undesirable features and then these features will provide to the model for the learning process and then the output will get tested so there is a task of uh, learning uh, and testing so uh, there are various applications apart from the remote sensing first i will cover all the applications then i will uh, be specific towards uh, remote sensing so the applications of uh, remote sensing involve the image recognition uh, speech recognition there is a traffic prediction is there product recommendations self driving cars virtual personal assistant and there are a lot of applications and uh, nowadays it is uh, the machine learning is everywhere almost now there is a one example is a automatic autonomous car uh, this is a pens uh, autonomous cars in which there are multiple sensors have been installed there is like a gps for navigation there is a lidar is there for light uh, for light detection and radio and there are still sony cameras so what the function of all these uh, sensors to take the output and uh yes i think there is a disturbance uh okay
Okay, uh, Lakshminder sir, is it possible to uh, mute your mic? Actually, there is a... uh, definitely, sir. I'll just inform the ma'am to please mute their mic. Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, then in order of there is a stereo uh, stereo cameras are there which uh, acquire the information from the left and right side. And then the all the information is converted into the uh, some electrical form and further uh, converted into the uh, presentable that is uh, referred to as a pre processed and then provided to the neural networks so that it can learn the and take the actions on the road. So that is the task of uh, autonomous uh, cars and then there is a Google uh, ML and uh, hopefully you all are aware of that there is a Google machine learning and it is everywhere in the Google applications. So some of the applications that I have highlighted here you know first that is a, a auto translations that is a conversion of a, any language that auto detect the language and convert it into a desirable form and the second one is a there is a, a your voice recognition function is there and then there is an email that is auto reply yes auto replies and hopefully this is a very one of the very benefit beneficial for us to uh, to just uh, uh, just click in on this uh, auto replies and send it to the concerned person so and then another one is a gps that is also using the ml to uh, just find the shortest route and which is less crowded and we all are aware of that this Google Mini and which uh, helps you, uh, which receives the uh, voice commands and make your home automation. And uh, there is a one more uh, app is here. There is a Google Photos and if you have used it, that is a one of the very powerful tool. You can just uh, check it out and it basically uh, recognizes the faces and make the videos and the pictures. So some other applications includes the weather predictions, uh, face detections, uh, then the uh, conversion of the spoken words into the text, then the medical diagnosis, uh, which uh, which recognizes the certain type of diseases. Then there is a financial uh, industries and trading, so uh, basically used for the fraud uh, investigations and the credit checks. So the uh, the machine learning uh, basically divided into the three groups and that is a very general form that is divided into the three parts that is a supervised in which there is a requirement of the external supervisions to give the uh, training data set and then uh, in a unsupervised there is no need to give the training data set so there is no need of uh, external supervision and uh, the reinforcement learning is a th uh, third type of a machine learning in which there is a sorry and <clears throat> the third type is a reinforcement learning that is a reward waste uh, in which and it is more useful for the uh, robot navigations and it is reward waste that i will cover a little bit later now the types uh, the unsupervised learning is divided uh, or uh, used for the used to solve the two types of problems that is a dimensionality reductions and which is more useful for the big data visualizations meaningful compression structure discovery uh, feature facilitation then the clusters uh, clustering unsupervised are used for the uh, recommender systems targeted marketing customer segment etc and this uh, this uh, supervised learning um, designed to the solve the two types of problems and here we are more interested in this classification problems because it is used for the image classifications so uh, apart from this there are some other uh, examples are there identify the fraud detections customer retention and diagnosis and the regressions are especially used for the there is weather forecasting uh, marketing market forecasting estimating life expectancy population growth prediction and uh, there is another time there is a reinforcement learning there is a reward based and uh, if if you uh, took the right uh, action then it will give you the reward if you took the wrong uh, action then it will give you the uh, negative sign so this is a positive and negative all about the give you the rewards or there is no reward and there is used to uh, detect the uh, real time decisions and uh, robot navigations learning tasks skill acquisitions and game artificial intelligence game 
so these are, are the basic difference between all these three categories that is a supervised supervised as i already told you that is based on the external supervisions and uh, used to design the solve two types of problem regression and classification whereas the unsupervised that is uh, no supervision is required and especially designed to solve the association and the clustering problems on the third end there is a, a reinforcement learning and in which an agent interacts with its environment by producing the actions and discovers the error or rewards. So there is no supervision is required and it is reward based. So there are some popular examples for the supervised learning and the unsupervised and the reinforcement learning. So uh, there is, let us begin with the uh, machine learning and it actually starts from the learning a class from the examples. So this is a, one of the very basic example uh, of a machine learning. And uh, for example, if someone wants to uh, buy a family car and the family car uh, and the family car, which uh, doesn't uh, require much, uh, there are two axes are there. That is the engine part is there. And the second one is the price is there. So if the family car doesn't want the higher engine power or the uh, lower engine power and uh, as well as there is a no requirement of the costly uh, cars and the cheaper cars. So they must lie in between the this range within that particular range. So in this uh, we have plotted uh, this graph just a second. Okay, uh, we have plotted uh, this graph in which there are two types of examples. There are positive examples which actually belongs to the family car and there are negative examples are there which uh, belongs to the uh, other cars or a uh, unrelevant cars. So this is actually referred to as a two class or a binary problem. So in this case, the in a first, in a very first time, the uh, there is a hypothesis is created. So it is uh, further that is a, a simplified and uh, there are some examples have been created that is a false positive examples and the false negative exam examples so but here we are more interested in this there is a, uh, and here you can check it out this is a, a three border lines we have created the first one is referred to as a general hypothesis this one is referred to as a general hypothesis this uh, rectangle box is defining the uh, actual hypothesis and this one is a specific hypothesis and there is a margin in between the there are specific and the general hypothesis so what will happen uh, there is another type there is a learning from the multiple classes in which there are three types of classes are there there is a sports cars are there luxury cars are there and the family cars are there and uh, these are three types of uh, hypothesis induced and uh, each one is covering the each one type of a uh, class category and where the quotients uh, mark are there they are actually representing the rejected area and remain unclassified so this is a uh, this is a uh, task of learning uh, there is a learning a class from the examples or learning from the multiple classes so uh, there is one more example that is a binary versus multi-class in a binary when there are only two classes are there and in a multi-class multi -class, uh, classifications when there are more than two classes are there. So uh, we can also convert this multi-class problem into the binary class problem uh, by selecting the desirable property and ignore rest of the rest of the classes. For example, here I am interested in the uh, triangles there is a class one there is selecting only the desirable and uh, and just ignore rest of the or convert it into the another type of class category the rest of there is uh, class two and class three are combined each other with each other and in a second here where i'm more interested in the circles and in which there is a circles are separated from the rectangle sorry uh, these crosses and the triangles and in third in a third type of a uh, problem that is converted into the from the multi-class to the binary in which i am more interested in the crosses uh, instead of the circle and the triangles so uh, there is a one uh, important point regarding this we can convert multi-class uh, classification into the binary class but the vice versa is not possible so this is point you have to remember it and now uh, we <coughs> just get into the little bit more details that is the unsupervised learning the unsupervised learning doesn't uh, require the 
training data set that i have already told you and give the decisions on the basis of the similarities score so on the basis of the similarity between uh, some kind of uh, gray scale levels uh, or uh, there is a number of white portion or num there is a dark portion over there that is on the basis of that it will give the or it will assign the class so that is on the basis of the similarity and there is a one of the example of the uh, unsupervised uh, classification or learning that is a k-min clustering and in a k-min clustering uh, there is a task of grouping a set of data points and it groups the data points that are similar to each other uh, similar or there is a similar to or near to each other so in this there is a k-min algorithms allow the clusters to center to shift in order to optimize the performance index and that i will explain you with the help of following example and here you can uh, see that in a very first figure initially there are random uh, five clusters have been assigned and in the next iteration there is a second iteration part is there the these clusters uh, are shifted towards the center of the data points so uh, by increasing the number of iterations it will reach at this particular decision in which there are uh, the these uh, circles or uh, these clusters are actually like this uh, you can take this example there is a triangle is there that is actually representing the there is a center of the all data points and please note that there is a one is uh, one data point is remain unclassified and uh, that will uh, give you the that will uh, give you the error so there is a uh, unclassified uh, pixels are remain there may be a possibility of uh, unclassified pixels in unsupervised learning so in order to solve the uh, unsupervised learning uh, there is a supervised learning is there now uh, this the, there is a one more important point there is a supervised the accuracy of the supervised learning is higher as compared to the unsupervised learning so in a uh, why it is so because uh, it requires the training data set from the user end so means uh, it uh, utilizes the knowledge of uh, uh, means utilizes the knowledge of the user also uh, including the algorithm so uh, whatever the uh, whatever the algorithms which require the training data set or external supervisions that is referred to as a supervised learning and uh, there is a one of the method of a supervised learning knm and it is widely used for the pattern recognition and statistical estimations so here you can just i will give you this uh, example there is a example is there in which there is a one pixel is there and we have to find the actual uh, record of this data point is it belongs to a uh, positive or negative because there are only two classes uh, there are two samples are there and we have to identify that uh, on which sign it this unknown record belongs to so uh, in this case i have used this k is equal to 3 and what is means the k is equal to 3 means there are how many uh, samples i will consider how many samples i will consider to identify this data point so according to this i have used 3 3 means i have used 3 uh samples and on the basis of the majority this will this unknown record will be assigned to the positive sign so and in another case that there are three examples are there by in which i am varying the value of k if the value of k is one then it means i am considering only the one data set so on the basis of that definitely this x will belong to the minus sign and on the other end uh, if uh, if i am uh, changing the value of k to then there are two samples have been considered to find the record of uh, this x point so uh, on the basis of there is a equal majority is there so on the basis of the nearest it will assign to the negative point and the negative sign and in a third if i change the value of k is 3 value of k uh, is equal to 3 then there are three samples have been considered and on the basis of the majority there are two positive signs are there this will this will be assigned to the positive 
so these are the concept of the KNN, and I will also explain you with the help of this uh, distance measurement how we are performing, and this is an algorithm. And those who are doing the research, they have to design such kind of uh, flowcharts to perform the uh, classifications. So in the initial, we have uh, this type of a data point that is unknown record, and first there is a the distance is computed from all the nearest points. In this case, all the nearest points, then we have to assign this value of K. If we have provided the value of K3, then it means three samples have been taken into the account to, to guess this, to guess the record of this question. Or there is a unknown record, and on the basis of the majority, it will assign to the class B, which is a green triangle. So there is a one dilemma in the selection of the K. Uh, there is a k value. If the k is too small, then it is more sensitive to the noise point. If k is too large, the neighborhood may uh, include points from the other classes. So this is the one of the disadvantage of the k and n method. So there is a one more classifier is there. That is a decision uh, decision tree is there. The decision tree is a hierarchical model for the supervised learning. And it is composed of the internal decision nodes and the terminal leaves. So the uh, decision nodes are representing with the oval nodes, and the and the terminal nodes are representing with the there is a uh, rectangular or square nodes. So uh, in this classification problems, we have uh, two types of the classes. There is one is square, and another one is a circles. So we have to solve this classification problems with the help of decision tree. How we can do it? Uh, we can do it very easily uh, by just selecting there is a in a first decision node we have put this criteria if x is if x1 is greater than w10 then what it means that if x is greater than 1 then there are two categories are there that will we will discuss a little bit later but if it is not fulfill these conditions if x is less than 10 then definitely the all the uh, all the data points will belong to the circle. But in the another case, if it is uh, more than, if the W10 is more than, sorry, if the X1 is uh, more than W10, then it belongs to the, there are two categories are there. So we have to apply some another decision also here. And here we have applied, if X2 is W, if X2 is greater than W20, then it will belongs to the scale, that is a scale, and if it is less than W20, then it will belongs to the data circles. So in this way, we can classify the data. And uh, there is a one problem uh, which is associated with the decision tree. There is a overfitting problems. The there may be possibility of uh, the good accuracy on the training data, but poor on the test data. And the symptoms may be too is too deep and too many branches. There are two approaches are there uh, in which by which we can uh, solve this problem of the overfitting by with the help of pre-pruning method and the post-pruning. In the in the pre-pruning methods, uh, we can uh, halt the tree construction earlier, but it is very difficult to decide the parameters when we have to stop the uh, decision tree. And the post-pruning methods includes the uh, remove the branches or subtrees from the fully grown trees. So uh, there is again a very uh, little bit uh, tricky and uh, challenging task. So in order to solve uh, the decision tree problems, there is a, a random forest is there. Random forest is uh, one of the uh, one of the very efficient classification algorithm that consists of many decision trees. And here you can uh, see that. Here you can see that. In a first tree, there is a uh, two parameters have been considered. The first one, for example, there is a, in a bucket, there are fruits are there. And in order to uh, segregate these fruits, we have used two parameters. Where the first one is a diameter and second is a color. And in a second tree, we have used the color and the shape. And in a third tree, we have used diameter and there is a season of the season of growth. So is it in either uh, either in our summer or winter? So that is uh, bifurcated according to the different trees. 
So what are the uh, main applications of the, uh, this random forest? It can be used in enhanced thematic mapper devices to acquire the images of the earth surface and it can be used for the object detections and it can also be it is actually using in the random forest in a game console called Kinect. and currently it has been discontinued uh, but uh, still there are applications are there now there is a one more important uh, part of our machine learning that is the neural network so the neural network uh, is basically similar to the humans uh, human brains neural network and a neuron uh, as a basic unit of the neural network which collects and classify the information according to the specific architecture so uh, here th that is uh, just referred to as a neuron and which performs uh, some kind of a functions and uh, we can also say it as a transfer function and there are two inputs are there there is a x1 and x2 in which uh, in which are associated with the two different grids and here is a one or more input is there that is called bias and the bias is generally used to provide each and every node with the tenable constant value so uh, and these transfer functions will perform some kind of operations and provide you the output so the function uh, is a nonlinear and called be as activation functions and there are several types of activation functions uh, you may encounter in the practice and uh, those uh, those are uh, sigmoid and uh, tan h the sigmoid is basically which uh, takes the real value input and uh, provides the range in between the zero end and gives the output gives the output in between the range of zero and one whereas the tan h will provide the range in between there is a minus one to one that is uh, zero to one and there is a value value is there that is uh, uh, referred to as a rectified linear unit and it takes the real valued input and give you the output in a very uh, real time scenarios and just uh, give or just change the value of negative side with equal to zero so there is a function of the relu and uh, there are various types of the neural networks and uh, i will try my best to cover as much as possible uh, so uh, there is an entire uh, all there are there are a lot of uh, neural network types are there let us begin with the first one is a presbyton the presbyton is the simplest and the uh, oldest model of the neuron and it takes the uh, some inputs and gets the output so there is no any magic uh, is there there is no any uh, function is there so that is a very basic model so it is further uh, improved by the feed forward model in which there is a hidden layer is there so hidden layer which performs uh, some kind of operations and give you the output and it uses or it is based on the logistic function so the the next model is a radial basis network uh, which uh, which is just a feed forward network but the only difference there is a different type of a function is there which is referred to as a radial function and then if we are using more than more than one hidden layer then these are referred to as a deep feed forward networks so here you can see that in a feed forward network simple feed forward network we have used only one hidden layer but in case of a deep for feed forward network we have used more than one hidden layer so in a recurrent uh, neural network uh, there is a in which each of the hidden cell received its own output with the fixed play that is represented with the this blue blue circle and there is a next is a there is a long and short term memory there is again this is a recurrent neural network and uh, but the only difference is that uh, it can store more than 10 words whereas the rn methods can store up to the up to the 10 words but the long and short term memory can store more than 10 words so that is the difference between these two uh, neural networks and then there is another type of uh, another type of neural network is there that is gated recurrent unit in a gated recurrent unit they are uh, we are using just a different gates there is only difference between these two we are using different types of gate combinations and they are less resource consuming than the ls tm method so uh, this and the next one is a autoencoder the autoencoder is also one type of uh, uh, 
unsupervised method and and frequently used for the classification clustering and the feature compressions and here you can why it is called as auto encoder because there are large number of inputs are there and it compress that is a we can also say it as a encode encode into a smaller number of in a uh, smaller number of uh, values and then decode into the same number of values as a number of inputs so in this case that is encoder and decoder that is referred to as a auto encoder and the further there is a variational uh, auto encoder is there which compresses the probability instead of the features and then there is a denoising uh, auto encoders are there in which there is a little bit of noise has been added to the input cells and uh, there is a space a that is uh, very similar to the a but only difference is that the hidden layer there are more number of cells in the hidden layer as compared to the input and the output so the next one is a markov chain the markov chain is not the actually uh, neural network in the classical way but uh, they are used for the classification based on probabilities and then the next one is a uh, hope field is there hope field are the trained on the limited uh, set of the samples so that they can respond to the uh, known samples and uh, then boltzmann uh, machine is there which uh, again there is a uh, there are only limited number of the inputs and rest are printed as a hidden that is a prob uh, probabilistic that is a hidden cells and uh, there is a next one is that is a restricted uh, bm model is there then deep uh belief network is there which is a uh, very uh, uh, which is nothing but a stacking of the previous this uh, oh, there is a hope field networks and then there is a uh, deep convolution model is there D deconvolution is there then the deep convolution the inverse graphic method is there so uh, we are using uh, so frequently and these are type of the auto encoders and uh, they are actually stars of the artificial neural network and very typically used for the image recognition and they operate on a very small set of the images so the actual the input image is divided into the small parts and then it is further processed by the convolution network so and there are a lot of other uh, neural networks are there but these are not only limited and once you will get check it out the for research papers you will get to know there are no more number of uh, neural networks are there and these are the actual base of our deep learning now the machine learning applications in the remote sensing and uh, these uh, so far we have done a lot of work in the uh, three basic fields that is a uh, classification chain deductions and the fusion and there is a uh, one of uh, our more recent paper uh, with the dr reet kamal tiwari and uh, as we normally we are talking about the climate change is there and then global warming is there the the point is that how we are measuring that value so uh, in our way we are measuring with the help of the snow because there is a direct or indirect impact of a climate on a snow so it is uh, very important to monitor the snow over the indian himalayas so here i will show uh, we have done uh, some kind of a work there is a detection of the spatial temporal snow cover variability in the himalayas uh, using scattered one and this is a scattered one that is uh, as uh, dr reet kamal tiwari told that there is a uh, two types of sensors there is a uh, there is a first of all i will tell you this first there is a optical sensor and it is a very similar image which you have vision which you can visualize through the uh, google earth and this is a uh, there is a radar image this is a radar, radar image and uh, and it there is a one uh, there is a, a lot of advantages as well as the disadvantages of these two images in a first there is a, the scatterometer has a advantage of there is a penetration through the clouds and it this image can even be acquired in the night and on the other hand there is a optical image uh, which uh, we can visualize through the uh, there is a google earth there is a uh, the, those images are acquired only the daytime and another problem is associated with this model there is a oh, sorry uh, these images optical images is that they are extremely affected by the or in the presence of the clouds so that is a one of the disadvantage but the advantage 
of this optical data it gives you the information in a multispectral or a hyperspectral which is not possible with the this scatterometers so however the our interest in this research is to identify the so which can be possible uh, with the this scatterometer data and here you can uh, see that we have identified uh, we have first classified the data and we have uh, I will just give you the one example and uh, in our December 2016 and in Jan 2017 we have classified the data of these two uh, dates and then we have subtracted pixel by pixel and we have identified that there is a uh, there is a uh, increment in the snow during the same period but in 2017-18 during the same that is the december and jan there is a decrement in snow so why we are studying this kind of uh, information because uh, this kind of a uh, there is a, a rapid change in the change in the snow that is very harmful uh, and that directly leads to the uh, snow avalanche activities and as well as that leads to the floods as uh, you all are aware of that there are recent floods are there and why they are doing why they are occurring there is a main reason is that there is a sudden uh, change in the there is a snow level so if the uh, if it is con, uh, directly or suddenly changes from the snow to the ice or ice into water then there is a problem for us so that kind of uh, that kind of a problems we are identifying through this study so in this uh, we not only find out the uh, there is a time duration but we have also find out the elevation point uh, on and uh, we have identifying that the himachal is basically there is a ranging from the elevation range 450 meters to the 6000 or approximately 7000 meters so we have identifying that there is a, a very uh, this impact has been occurred at a elevation range in between the 4000 to the 6000 so that is the most uh, prone areas uh, where the there where, uh, there is a maximum possibility of the snow avalanches, and we can uh, enhance the research uh, our research by separating or by exploring such kind of a studies. So this is a further application if you are able to find out the snow avalanches over the this region. There is a uh, one more study that uh, we have. Uh, uh, that uh, that we have published uh, last year in which uh, we have uh, uh, just highlighted the different uh, products of the scatterometer satellites and uh, it can be used for the uh, global level ice monitoring that is the uh, ice cover products are there that is ice cover monitoring or snow monitoring and uh, there is a uh, india level products are there we can also identify the those snow levels throughout the India, we can also we can also identify the snow level over the South Polar and over the North Polar, and there is a third pole. And the, the Himalayas are actually referred to as a, a third pole of the Earth because there is a maximum uh, snow is there. So this is a, one of the most important natural uh, resource uh, for the Indians uh, because. Uh, there is uh, these Himalayas providing the water, the water supply to the entire North India, and which can be used for the electricity purposes, electricity generation purposes, agriculture purposes, and many other factors. So the monitoring of this snow is one of the very important or critical tasks. So this is a one more study that we have conducted recently, in which we have removed the or we have uh, avoid the clouds. From the optical satellite imagery by the fusion of the scatchet and the Modis data, and here you can uh, see that in the Modis, that is an optical image, and in these are uh, these are uh, highly affected with the clouds, but there is a no effect on there is a scatterometer because uh, it can penetrate through the clouds. So what we can do, we can just because there is a one more important point is here. The Modi data, there is a uh, 36 spectral bands are there, and there is only the one. There is a one uh, band is there. That is a KU band is there. That is operating on a 13.5 gigahertz, and that is a numerous bands are there. That is advantage. The disadvantage of this data is a clouds. So the advantage of there is no cloud data, but the problem is that there is only one or two bands are there. 
so what we can we can do the fusions and then we can perform the classification so uh, we have analyzed that when we have classified this image this modis image then we can see the cloud effects there but uh, when we have classified this is a uh, we have classified with the help of artificial neural network and when we have classified this one then there is a uh, no effect of a clouds but when we have fused the both the images and we have concluded that we have got this kind of an image and then we have performed the pixel by pixel comparison with the reference data set and concluded that there is a more accuracy have been achieved with the there is a fused classified imagery as compared to the scatterometer and the mori so uh, this there is a there is a microwave data the sketch set and the modis is a optical data and so then uh, this uh, this one also we have uh, published in uh, 2020 that is uh, evaluation of the sketch set one data for snow cover area mapping with the help of the three classifier that is a unsupervised uh, k-mean clustering then there is a one uh, classifier is here that is a smooth vector machine and this is a linear spectral mixing so this is a one of the different kind of a classifier that i will tell you a little bit uh, later so uh, in the next study we can also uh, performed on this detection of the snow and ice uh, cover changing uh, changes using the this sub pixel based change detection approach over the chota shigri glacier so this is a, a chota shigri glacier that is uh, one of the most important glacier and uh, we have analyzed the data from 2001 to the 2019 and analyzed that it is uh, shrinking uh, and it is a uh, shrinking and uh, you can uh, yet i have not uh, pasted the actual input but here you can analyze the changes so there are maximum changes uh, can be observed which are converted from the snow to ice or uh, ice to barren that is in the period of 2010 to 2019 so there is a one problem why we have used this sub pixel there is a sub pixel here you can check it out there are only two classes are there practically there are two classes that is a barren and the other one is a ice there are only two classes when we can compare with the high resolution data this is the actual natural color image and these two are the false color correction image and in this we can uh, we can easily check it out there is a two classes are there there is a barren and another one is ice but uh, practically uh, but uh, in the Oh, excuse me, there is uh, some problem. Uh, uh, actually, just hold for a second. Uh, there is a nice problem. Okay. Uh, okay, yes. So, uh, in this, in the next point, there is a, uh, but in case of a sub pixel, there are only, not only the two classes, there is a mixed category is also there. So the subpixel classification will help uh, us in identifying the what is actually lies in between the these uh, mixed pixels. So that I will. Okay, now there is a, I will uh, explain there is a subpixel phenomena with the help of this example. And this we have uh, published this study in a 2019 in, the, in space research. And here you can check it out. And if we have a two classes are there, uh, there is a barren and the snow. And uh, because the resolution of the Modis data set or uh, there is a, a satellite data set is not too much high. Because currently the Modis data set is providing the least uh, resolution or uh, maximum resolution of the 250 meters. So what it means, the 250 meter means there is a, a two, uh, there is a single pixel of a Modis satellite data sets covering the 250 meter area of the actual ground. And, uh, and it, there may be possibilities more than two class categories or two or more than two class categories lie within the same pixels. So uh, in order to uh, separate those pixels or identifying those pixels, we need a, that is a sub pixel classification. So here you can check it out here. There is a 
baron is there this is a baron that a satellite image and uh, we have just uh, uh, subsetted a very small uh, area in which there is a baron is there and this one is a snow is there but what about this there is a, a mixture of the white and maroon so what is actually is occurring over there so we can check it out uh, with the help of uh, the high resolution data set here we can once we have checked then we have identified that there is a mixture of the barren as well as the snow so that is a kind of a mixture we have to identify that and we have to separate it out from the classifications because otherwise it will mislead to the classification uh, or um, uh, decrease the accuracy of the classification so there is another study that uh, we have performed that is the nearest neighbor diffusion based pan sharpening using modis and the uh, heavy starter and uh, this is a very initial study that we have performed here you can check it out this is providing the very high resolution uh that is a very high resolution and there is lower resolution but the advantage of that that is providing 36 spectral bands information and that is four spectral band information so so what we have done we have taken uh, one uh, image from this and we have fused together with the modis data set and we will get this kind of uh, information so that is a improved resolution and here you can check it out that is a input these two are the input image and once we have combined these two image we will get this kind of output and that is much higher resolution as compared to the as compared to the this input data set and basically the fusion methods are uh, adding the feature of both these two images so the applications uh, of the machine learning in the remote sensing is not limited and uh, we are currently we are also exploring the scatterometer in the agriculture land for the uh, uh, for the soil moisture estimation and uh, and there are a lot of scholars PLD scholars from your university are already collaborating with us and they are working on the this agriculture activities uh, or uh, this uh, yield estimation then soil moisture estimation etc and uh, there is also some of the students are also working on this uh, uh, fusion methods so these all are very interesting and uh, you can also contribute uh, uh, you can also contribute your uh, inputs in this way and uh, at, at the end i acknowledge all the references used in this presentations i also thanks to the uh, uh, isro for providing the scatterometer data and i also thanks to the uh, there is an nrsc the isro for providing the dv and dem there is a digital elevation model and the evis data thanks are also to nasa for providing the modis and land set data and uh, uh, the most of uh, this uh, presentation uh, is uh, basically the outcome of the uh, project which is sponsored by the DST and SERP. And uh, this project is in collaboration with the Dr. Reed Kamal Tiwari. Uh, thanks. If there is any question, then uh, we are now, you can please feel free to ask. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sitaj, for such an eye-opening session. And uh, now I would like to uh, ask the participants if there are some queries which they want to ask from both expert speakers, they can ask it, ask right now any queries which they want to ask. I think the sir want to ask some questions on you. Uh, good morning, Dr. Sapaz. Good morning, Dr. Uh, so, uh, sir, uh, I have a small query. Like, uh, there is decision tree and random forest. So, uh, can you elaborate, like, where we will prefer uh, the decision tree and where we will prefer the random forest? Uh, some uh, suitable with some suitable example. Can you elaborate that? Uh, okay, sir. If uh, the basically the decision tree is designed for uh, some specific task, uh, for example, just uh, actually I have not uh, currently not sharing my screen. Okay, just a second. I will try to reshare my screen. Okay, the basic point is that when you have to expect it, the uh, minimum number of the points, there is a minimum number of the features, then you can use the 
uh, decision tree. But if you want to extract or consider the more number of features uh, while uh, doing the classifications, then you have to follow the random forest. And uh, as far as uh, previously, we have done work on the decision tree as well as on the, this random forest. And we have observed that the accuracy of the random forest is higher as compared to the decision tree, even if we are selecting the lower number of features. And the second uh, the point is that uh, uh, the, there is a no overfitting uh, problem in the random forest and which is very generalized in the decision tree. So uh, my, if you want to uh, consider more features, then definitely you have to go towards the random forest. If you are considering less number of features, you can opt the decision tree. But once you, uh, but you can also compare with random tree before finalizing. There is, uh, uh, I can suggest. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, one more uh, thing I would like to uh, add. If we are having yes, some uh, yeah. imbalanced uh, data set, like for one class, we are having suppose 40% uh, of the data in comparison to other class. So then uh, what will be the preferable technique for classification? How we will do with that? Okay, so basically there are multiple classification techniques are there that I have already uh, there is uh, mentioned in the one of my slides. There is a linear spectral unmixing. That is how we can uh, normally also call it as a linear spectral mixing or the linear spectral unmixing. That is basically a process of unmixing the, that is a, uh, because uh, that I think the Dr. Reed Kamal Tewari can give the exact accurate answer on this because he have done a very, uh, uh, very deep work in a, a sub pixel classification and in object based classification. So, uh, sir, please can you elaborate? Yeah, uh, the linear uh, mixer, uh, unmixing, spectral unmixing. Here, what we do is uh, we, when there is a mix of the class uh, in, uh, uh, like in remote sensing, uh, what happens that if the size of a pixel is suppose 30 meter by 30 meter, then there will be more than one classes which will be falling into that pixel. Uh, suppose uh, if we take the example of the uh, natural object, uh, suppose there is a road, road uh, will not everywhere be 30 meter wide. So road will be mixed with the surrounding area. And so the spectra of that pixel, if we'll form the spectra of that pixel, that uh, spectra will be mixture of road and mixture of the surrounding area that is the ground part so we'll have a uh, that spectra will be called as the mixed spectra so we compare uh, the spectra of both the classes and we try to find out that what will be the percentage of uh, mix of the classes in that particular area like in that 30 meter by 30 meter pixel how much uh, what quantity of that pixel is road and what quantity of that pixel is uh, the uh, surrounding ground area so that is the basic idea uh, for that um, but uh, the uh, so this is the way we use uh, sub pixel classification and there is a very new area which has also come into uh, this is uh, super resolution mapping here uh, in the sub pixel classification what we do is that we only find out uh, find out that what is the percentage of mixing of a of the two classes in a particular pixel that what is the percentage of class proportion we say that in the technical term what is the class proportion of road and what is the class proportion of ground object but using the algorithms of super resolution mapping uh, there are two or three algorithms like pixel filling and other algorithms i don't remember percent will be uh, falling so using a low resolution data we can create a map of a high resolution and that technique is known as super resolution and it is one of the very good area where uh, the computer science people can work because it, it involves a lot of algorithms and here uh, a kind of remote sensing people are uh, lacking so uh, uh, this is a very new field where uh, super resolution mapping 
and where uh, computer science people can really contribute a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you for explaining it so nicely, Dr. Tiwari and Dr. Tillu. Uh, anybody else who wants to ask some query, if there is any doubt in the session? As I can see, many thanks and uh, acknowledgements are pouring in the chat box. So, but if there is any query you want to ask, So, if anyone has any query, they can ask, and even if uh, they can, uh, they want to discuss it further with us uh, later on. Um, I think they can take uh, our contact detail from uh, you, and uh, yes, they can call, sir, uh, write a, yeah, write us a mail or uh, call us. Anything is fine with me. Uh, definitely, so uh, it would be uh, really beneficial if you can put this lecture over the YouTube. But we, can, we will put this lecture over the YouTube channel. This the whole yeah. We will put this on the YouTube channel. Yeah, Doctor Sartaj, we the materials that you have shown is uh, I think uh, all published. Yes, sir. It's all published, and uh, I think there is no any problem. Okay, yeah. sir. So it, thank it, you, sir. It, it will be very uh, really beneficial for us. Okay, so today's session was an eye-opening session for all the researchers who must be working in the field of machine learning and specifically if they're working in the field of uh, remote sensing, this must be a really enlightening session for you all. Now, with the permission of the chair, I would like to propose a formal vote of thanks. I would uh, like to heartily thank the speakers for their efforts towards delivering the lecture on machine learning and remote sensing application. I mean, I like to express our sincere thanks to Dr. Tiwari for explaining the concepts of remote sensing and also for giving an excellent coverage over core fundamentals of remote sensing. And further, I'm also grateful to Dr. Tillon for explaining the role of core machine learning concepts and its applications in remote sensing. In remote sensing. And uh, the whole session was quite interesting for all of us because it was something which we have not, uh, which we have not seen or basically not uh, been an audience to before. I would like to appreciate on record the enormous efforts put in by the organizers of Research Innovation Technology Lecture Series 2021, Dr. Dr. Deep Singh, Dr. Rabinav Bhandari, and Engineer Jashin Preet Singh too. I would like to thank all the participants for gracing this event and making it a huge success. Lastly, I wish to express my gratitude to our honorable HOD Dr. Raman Mani, without whose guidance and encouragement this event would not have been possible. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for coming here and delivering your lecture for sparing so, your time, your precious time. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, sir. Okay. Thanks a lot, ma'am. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you all. Now we'll uh, finish off this meeting. Thank you. Thank you.